I'm going to. Hello again, everyone. My name is Jack Dempsey. I'm an American writer and historian, and I'm speaking again here today, April 24th, Sunday, 2022, with my friend Mohammed Jihad Ismail, who lives in Gaza. And if you can see, well, as you can see, his conditions are quite dark on the screen, and this is because they have not had any electricity for at least the past 12 hours, more than half a day. It's normally perhaps eight hours. Also, he has a bit of a cough because the weather has been very harsh and changeable in Gaza, and it affects him because most Palestinians, as he has just told me, have very low immune systems because of the lack of proper nourishment, medicines, and other things. So we sincerely hope you'll bear with us this evening as Muhammad, in his half darkness and his condition, try to keep us up to date with what's happening. He and I are doing this series as an effort to keep the conversation going, to keep people aware of what's happening in Gaza, in the occupied territories, in Jerusalem, in apartheid Israel in general. Uh, it's so important that we keep these people in our minds and hearts because we're so distracted, I think deliberately, by the war and the terrible ongoing events in Ukraine. But we'll get to those as well. So excuse the long introduction, Mohammed, but I welcome you. I thank you again for giving us your time to keep us informed about the conditions in Gaza and in Palestine in general. So if you'd like to say your greeting or anything, I, I feel, feel that everybody would like to share my wishing you Ramadan Harim, which means may Ramadan be generous to you and all your family with its blessings, uh, especially to your three children your wonderful wife and the, the whole um, Israel family. We just really want to wish you the very best. So welcome and talk to us any way you wish. I'll ask you some questions too. Thank you, uh, dear friend. Uh, I am so happy to, uh, to be again with you to talk about the situation in Gaza and in Palestine generally. Uh, I am so happy for, uh, for this new opportunity. Well, as uh, we've often begun these conversations, I think maybe there are even some people who are looking and listening for the first time. And to just try to sum up what you and I could call the usual conditions of human beings living in Gaza and the territories, there's a terrible shortage of drinkable water. The food situation is almost absurd. You have a couple of hundred trucks per day being allowed into Gaza, but with two, two and a half million people that need to be fed, that's about 12,000 people that need to be fed off each truck. And they don't all bring in food. They also bring, uh, I don't know, medicine, energy, all kinds of equipment and items that people have to have to live. Uh, there are suicides all the time in Gaza because of complete despair. The place is in ruins. It's under complete blockade. So it's living under the apartheid regime of the Israelis, and it's also living under a very inflexible government, Hamas, that does not allow elections and does not really welcome criticism either. So I think the first question that everybody wants to always ask you, Mohammed, is how do you do it? How are you coping this week with these kinds of unspeakable conditions that have been going on for more than 15 years? Unfortunately, uh, we are suffering from, uh, as usually, suffering from the occupation, the occupation of the Israelis. Also, we are suffering from uh, the lack of liberties here in, in Gaza. And generally in, in, in Gaza and West Bank, we are suffering from lack of liberties. Uh, we have no freedoms, no, no enough freedoms. You cannot express a uh, European, you cannot criticize <coughs> any, any uh, government, any uh, uh, ministry, any uh, officer related to the government. 
So uh, we are silenced here in, in Gaza and in uh, uh, West Bank also. We are silenced from both, from the occupation and uh, unfortunately from our uh, leadership, the Palestinian leadership, whether uh, Hamas or the PA. And, you know, I'm looking at your image, Mohammed, and it is so dark, the room that you're in. And this is because you were working off of batteries that you put together in order to store some electricity. Now, let's try to imagine almost the whole rest of the world, even one day or one week without electricity, it's considered a major catastrophe. How can people possibly live anymore without these things? Then you have the, sh the food shortages and everything else, your government, and which is supported by Western powers that are really not interested in making that government that they fund do the right thing. And then this week, as we talked a little bit earlier, just on the uh, earlier this week, the two of us, Gaza was being shelled again, was being bombarded with artillery, rockets, bombs. Can you tell a little about that? What are the causes of that? Well, this week, and there's another crisis too that's bearing down on the Palestinians, which again, we'll get to, but we're trying very hard our best to keep people informed. Gaza was shelled again this week. You said your own children were very frightened and upset and it took a lot of work to calm them down. Can you talk a little about that? Uh, before uh, the, uh, the raids on Gaza, I want to speak about the crisis of electricity. I feel myself that uh, I, I, uh, I, I look like the caveman. I, I look <laughs> like the caveman. No, you uh, don't. Unfortunately, since, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, since my uh, early childhood right now, now I am, uh, now I am approaching from my uh, fifth uh, decade of, of age, Unfortunately, from uh, my birth right now, uh, I am suffering from the same uh, crisis, the crisis of electricity. I, uh, I spent maybe the majority of my life, the majority of my hours, days, weeks, months in darkness. Uh, so uh, can you imagine how this uh, affect on my uh, psychological uh, situation. I am sure that I, uh, I became uh, depressed and uh, I am sure that if I uh, went to uh, consult uh, uh, a psychological uh, doctor, I am sure he will, he will diagnose so many uh, kinds of uh, diseases in my uh, conduct and my personality, I am sure from this. And I am talking about this frankly without, without, without being uh, shy. So uh, can you imagine how this uh, affect on me at least psychologically? Uh, as and you the just effect, mentioned- The effect on everyone, the effect on two and a half million people who are crowded into an area that's about what? 400 square kilometers? Of course, of course, of course. Uh, when you tell uh, a normal man uh, from the street, when you tell him that in Japan, in USA, in Sweden, in Canada, there are some people who have never seen the, the, the electricity shut down, he doesn't believe. He, uh, he, he think, uh, uh, you are talking about something like science fiction, telling lies. He doesn't believe <laughs> because the normal life is to be without electricity. Uh, uh, to speak about the uh, rates which uh, happened recently uh, in Gaza, uh, the rates were very, very uh, fierce and tough. Personally, uh, as Muhammad, my house was shaking like, uh, like a hut, uh, shaking under a hurricane, a huge hurricane, you know? Yes. Of course, my, my, uh, my, my children, my uh, very, very uh, young children, all of them used to cry, used to shout. So I used to, uh, to, to calm them 
to to give them toys, to give them some some sweets, <coughs> just to uh, raise their spirits. My uh, my son uh, woke up on uh, 1 a.m. due to the horrible sounds of the bombing. Uh, after we uh, tried many times with him, uh, he slept finally at 5 uh, a.m. <laughs> so after four, uh, four hours uh, of crying, of uh, fear, of anxiety, finally he slept after four hours. It's a very, very miserable uh, situation. I, I I have come to know your family just a little bit. Um, your wonderful wife and your three children. You have one young son who's about five or six years old and two beautiful new baby girls. And if the world could see how beautiful these children are, how sweet they are in their hearts and how intelligent and alive they are, I don't think they would be able to stand it for five minutes to hear the things that you're telling about. And on top of the artillery barrage, which may or may not have been related to some of the recent violence in Israel and in the territories, there's a Palestinian writer <clears throat> named Ramzi Baroud. He wrote for Counterpunch on the internet, April 22nd, and he points out that the Palestinian territories, Gaza and the West Bank are entering into a food crisis, not surprising with the little amount of food that comes in every day. But he said, for example, a chicken to feed your family one meal a day has gone from $6 to about $14. They figure that there's maybe three weeks worth of wheat supplies. That's an Oxfam study that shows that its price has gone up 25%. Do you notice symptoms? I mean, I know it's Ramadan, a time of fasting. You're already fasting on the diet that Israel allows into the uh, territory. But have you noticed these increases in prices? And what else are the conditions of your daily life that you've been dealing with? Yeah, I agree with uh, Mr. Ramsey, but uh, he, he minimized the, the, the prices. Uh, if you want to uh, to buy a chicken meal uh, or some raw or some raw chicken for your uh, children, I think you need at least twenty two dollars. At least twenty two dollars. Wow. wow. Yeah, yeah. It's very, 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 very expensive. Uh, and the same time here in Gaza, most of the people are without income. Most of them are uh, uh, under the poverty line. Uh, so uh, can you imagine how, how much uh, it is expensive to have a meal, a chicken meal here in Gaza? Personally, me, I didn't uh, uh, buy a chicken since maybe more than six uh, months ago. I didn't buy it because it's very, very expensive. So uh, directly, I, I look for some alternatives like frozen meat, like frozen fishes, because uh, as I told you, its price is very, very high. Yeah, <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to add something that I hope uh, at least a little bit would provoke our audience to realize something that for all the conditions we've already discussed, the fact is that Israel is in complete control of this situation. They are in complete control. They have every aspect of security, as they call it, under their control, including your food supplies and everything else that goes along with being an alive human being. So if they're in total control, then there is no possibility for them to deny that whatever happens because of the situation, it's their responsibility. If you are in control, then it is your responsibility. You agree? Yes, yes. Uh, if you want to speak about this issue, uh, unfortunately, uh, as I told you, uh, Israel, of course, is uh, responsible on what happened to uh, 
to us and is responsible on our daily uh, suffering here in Gaza. But the Israel, we have other parts. We have the Palestinians themselves. Uh, I used to speak it frankly. Uh, I, uh, I used to blame both, uh, the both, uh, the both governments, the uh, government of Gaza and the PA in West Bank. Yes. Because both, because both, because both of them are putting uh, high taxes uh, on uh, every uh, item uh, exported uh, into the market of Gaza. So, yes. uh, so as 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 a Palestinian consumer for goods, for the for the imported goods from uh, from outside, uh, for instance from China, from uh, Turkey, from uh, Italy, I should pay three kinds of taxes: one uh, one uh, one tax for Israel, uh, another tax for Hamas, third tax for PA. Can you imagine? In addition to my poverty, to my needless, to my bad situation, and to the high prices of of our goods, I should pay three taxes. That's why we have everything here is uh, expensive. And the Palis <laughs> the the Palestinian Authority taxes come as a very like a slap across your face because, as we've said before here, the truth is that they do not represent you. They do not speak for you. You do not, Gaza does not derive any benefit from the millions and millions of dollars of European and American support that are poured in there. There is no supervision of how they use the funds. So it comes as no benefit at all to the people of Gaza, and yet you must pay them taxes. This is what America launched its own revolution about. We will not pay taxes to the king if he does not listen to us in the House of Commons and Parliament. And yet the support is, is just not there. This is in the past year, a major year for Palestinians. Five different reports, international organizations that said and confirmed through careful study that yes, Israel is an apartheid state. Israel's own Betselem, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Harvard Law School and the United Nations Rapporteur did their own 19 page evaluation and said that the evidentiary standard for apartheid has been met in every category. I, 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 and then you put on top of this, this week's shelling, the artillery barrages, which were very severe. I don't, I don't know how the world can even begin to imagine how you are living, Muhammad. And so, I, I'm not even sure where to go from there. Do you want to add to that? Comments? Anything? Uh, I agree. I agree totally with you. Uh, we pay uh, high taxes for the PA, in addition to Hamas and Israel. Uh, but uh, PA doesn't pay one dollar for any projects, for any services for any, any, anything implemented in Gaza. No education, uh, no medicine. No, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing. Even, even when they send the medicine, this medicine is not bought by PA money, but uh, they, uh, they receive uh, some, some vans, some lorries from, uh, from uh, international uh, community. So, so they send them to Gaza as a materials, not as a, not as a money. Yes. But, uh, but if you want to speak about money, cash money, they doesn't pay any one dollar, any one single dollar for any project in Gaza. So this is the paradox. And I, I think that this explains too, in a very obvious way that one could almost miss, is that this is why Hamas, and the PA do not want to have new elections. They do not want the Palestinian people to vote for any new leadership because they know that they will not be voted for because they are doing nothing for their people. They know this in their hearts and that's why they stop any kind of work toward a new election that might bring hope to Palestinian negotiations for their rights. 
of course, of course, no doubt. Uh, this is sure, yes. And even uh, they doesn't allow you to make a questionnaire. If you want to make a public questionnaire, you are not allowed because this questionnaire will give some uh, some percentage, will will give some 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 numbers. These numbers will not satisfy them. No, and just and, I okay. think a couple of months ago, there was a very prominent man, a Palestinian activist who lived in the West Bank territories. He was becoming active as a critic and an alternate political voice against the PA. He was arrested, he was held, and he died in their custody. This is what happens. And there was a lot of rioting and anger from the Palestinian people that this has happened to a, a new spokesman of theirs. And yet it, it goes on all the time. How long do they think they can sustain this? Yes, yes. As I told you previously, there is no uh, liabilities in, in the Palestinian territories, Liberty. whether in Gaza or, yeah. or in West Bank. Uh, here you have to be repressed. You have to be silenced. You have uh, no uh, uh, chance to speak, to express your opinion. This is what happens here every day every day, unfortunately. And what you see in media is something very rare. The, 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 the fact of our situation is more more too, too much than what you uh, see in the media. I would like to ask you as a one other, one last before other topics, one last aspect of recent news from Palestine and living under the Israeli apartheid regime, and that is the attacks on the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the violence that ha has happened there. We discussed this again one-on-one, -on -one, and we both agree that these are deliberately provocations, uh, actions that are meant to tell the Palestinians that you are not going to hold the mosque much longer. I have seen in the media this week that there were uh, very large demonstrations around the world, India, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, where many Muslims live, uh, demonstrations against the attacks on the mosque and the different kinds of desecration that happened, the breaking of windows, using of tear gas, stun grenades, the Israeli soldiers running in there with their boots when it's absolutely required that you take your shoes off before you come in. They do these things as an insult. Do you think that there is going to be a summer like we had last year? Do you think there is going to be more violence or are people now going to perhaps back off, perhaps even maybe talk to each other? What do you think is going to come next, Mohammed? I don't think so. I don't think we are we are going to have a new war or new uh, uh, clashes, military clashes, or even uh, huge popular clashes between the Israelis and the Palestinians, because uh, uh, all the Palestinians are uh, tired and exhausted. Uh, for example, here in Gaza, people are not ready at all to, uh, to make a new uh, confrontation or war with Israel. Uh, people here are dying, starving. Uh, they, uh, they cannot uh, stand in front of Israel. Even in West Bank, people are tired and, and exhausted and repressed by the authorities. Uh, so uh, if you want to speak about the Palestinians, uh, I tell you, uh, all of them are tired. They cannot uh, make uh, a new round of uh, confrontation. Uh, and I think the same thing. Uh, Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah. The same thing on uh, on the other side. If you want to speak about the Israelis, I think uh, they too uh, are not uh, ready for something like that, because now they are looking to. Uh, uh, more prominent uh, targets like Iran, like the situation in Ukraine, like the, 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 the situation with Syria, with the Hezbollah on the northern border with Lebanon. 
So I think uh, even uh, Israel uh, uh, is not uh, thinking to make something against the Palestinians in the coming summer. Well, you've heard <laughs> many uh, you've heard many news reports from Ukraine that praise very much the spirit of the Ukrainian soldiers and fighters against the Russian forces. You almost never, I think never, hear Palestinians praised for their acts of resistance. And I think that must be awfully dispiriting for Palestinians. In other words, what you've just told me is more chilling and dark than even the prospect of another uprising or outright conflict in, with the Israelis and Palestinians because the Palestinians have such a proud, dynamic, strong spirit. And to hear them described as being so tired, so weary, undernourished, repressed, it sounds as if they are just being beaten into the ground. Yes, yes, I agree with you totally. Yes, that's right. Me too, I uh, use every day to watch uh, the, the news about what happened uh, in the Ukrainian uh, uh, invasion. I used to, uh, to watch every day and uh, I used to, to, uh, to focus on the Israeli attitude towards the, the invasion. Yeah. <coughs> yes. And I, I, I think I understood from reports this week that uh, Israel is more than not on Russia's side. Would you agree with that? Uh, they, they are uh, supporting uh, Russia? Yeah. Uh, no, no. Uh, 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 approximately every day, I used to uh, monitor the Israeli media, especially the media, uh, especially the, the, the media in, in English and in Arabic, uh, I used to see the articles which, uh, which are being written by Israeli authors or writers. Uh, the, the opinion, the majority of the opinion <coughs> in Israel is supporting for uh, Zelensky or Ukraine. Uh, because you know, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, there are too too many ties between uh, Zelensky and his regime with uh, Israel. Uh, so, if you want to speak about the intelligentsia, about the, the 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 writers and the authors' opinions, as what I see, most of them are against Russia. But and I do, don't does know that about. Include, does what, that include the right wing? of Israeli politics, because the right wing, you might imagine, and this is what I saw speculated, was that Russians and Israelis have much in common because they are both at war with a subject population, that they are both at war with a population that does not want to be governed by them. Uh, as I told you, if you want to speak about the intelligentsia, uh, most of their opinions are uh, against Russia. But if you want to speak about the normal people, the ordinary people, I think they are support Russia more than Ukraine, because now, now currently, we have more than 1 million Israeli citizens uh, came from uh, uh, Russian origins. So uh, it's a very, very uh, huge uh, percentage, yeah. more than 20% more than 20% of the Israelis uh, are uh, from uh, Russian origins. I see. <laughs> well, I don't mean to change the topic too abruptly, but during one of our recent private conversations, I had asked you a question about what are Palestinian women doing right now? Because at Al-Aqsa and other places of demonstration, it's almost always completely men that we see who are in front of the cameras, in the crowds, doing the marches, fighting, of course. And you mentioned that women who normally they worship at the nearby uh, Dome of the Rock. Is that correct? 
Yes, yes. And is there any kind of activity, protests, prayers, <laughs> anything going on among Palestinian women around their religious life and their religious centers? Here in uh, Gaza and West Bank, we have a very active and very powerful feminist movement. Uh, we have so many clubs for uh, feminist uh, activists. They are gathering, making uh, activities, making projects uh, all over the time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if you come, if if you come here to, to Gaza or to West Bank, you will see this uh, big uh, uh, performance. Yeah. yeah, yeah, activity for, for the for the Palestinian uh, feminists. Have there of been any are, have there been any yeah. negative episodes or events around the, the Dome of the Rock? Ha, have there been clashes with settler women and Palestinian women? A uh, few few uh, incidents. Uh, most most of the clashes are uh, actually uh, in the Al Aqsa Mosque. Because geographically, uh, uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque is uh, close to the Wailing Wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, so always the, the prayers who are uh, going to Al-Aqsa Mosque, always they are uh, finding themself, themselves uh, close to the uh, Israeli uh, uh, prayers who come to the wall. The, that's why always we have clashes in that in that place. I see. Now, as our time begins to go for this session, Mohammed, I'd like to mention to our audience something else that was to me very interesting that you had talked about in our earlier conversation. As you know, I'm talking to you from the Greek island of Crete, and there are many ancient connections between Crete and Palestine. In fact, the Philistine people uh, were in part originated in Crete after the fall of the Minoans, okay? I met some people here in Crete this week who met some tourists and they were from, uh, I think it was Lebanon and they asked them to come in and have uh, some food with us at all. And why have you come to Crete? And they said, because we are Philistines because we are Philistines and we come to Crete to see our heritage. We have been learning about our Philistine ancestors as part and the creators of Palestine, and we wanted to come and see them. Now, what I'm getting to is the writer, the great Greek writer, Nikos Kazantzakis, you mentioned in 1929, wrote a book about his travels in Palestine. As he was coming into the shore, he was asked what his first impressions were. And he said, the smell of the air, the scent of the air was the scent of his ancestors. And from this, you were mentioning that he also described the fact that Muslims and Christian people have always gotten along quite well. Or so it sounded from what you were saying. And I hope you could talk a little about that, that there's a long history of living as neighbors side by side with Christian people in the land of Palestine. Yes, yes. Uh, Nikos Kazantzakis came to Palestine uh, in the late 20s, uh, around uh, 1929. He came uh, to Palestine uh, aboard uh, a Greek ship. He came as a, a reporter or a correspondent for a Greek uh, newspaper. In the same time, he came to uh, the Holy uh, Land as uh, uh, a visitor to make like a pilgrim uh, pilgrimage. He used to make pilgrimage in, 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 in Bethlehem and uh, Jerusalem because he was uh, a pious Christian. Uh, through his book, which is entitled Journey to Palestine, he mentioned uh, too, too many uh, observations <coughs> were observed by his eye. So he was a writer and in the same time he was a witness. 
he used to uh, to to observe by his eye what happened in front of him in Jerusalem streets. He uh, spoke that we are going to have a colonial uh, Zionist project in the city and uh, Muslims and the Christians, both of them are going to be victims for this colonial uh, project. And he said in his, in his book, unfortunately, I see that this project is being supported by some Christian nations. At the uh, time, that would be Great Britain and the United States. Exactly, exactly. Uh, some critics, uh, most, of, most of them, of course, Arab critics, because I used to, uh, to read in Arabic uh, language that the opinions and uh, perspectives about this book, most of the Arabic critics I, 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 I read for them, <coughs> they used to classify Nico's book as the first book in history uh, to speak uh, frankly about uh, the danger of Zionism and the danger of the uh, Zionist project in Palestine. He spoke something, uh, something uh, weird. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he spoke in his book that after 20 years, only 20 years, uh, the Jewish state will uh, be set up. And uh, exactly that what happened. Uh, after 20 years of his visit to Jerusalem, uh, Israel uh, declared its independence yes. uh, on May, on May uh, 1948. Yes. But, and to add to that, the, the coexistence between the Christians and the Muslims and the Arabs and the Palestinians was a real thing, even, let's say, to your family. Muhammad, because in your home village of Shafir, for generations, as they say in the film, The Land Speaks Arabic, which can be seen for free on YouTube, an amazing piece of documentary about early Palestine, the generations of elders all remember that people live together, more or less as family, imperfect as all humans are, but they got along, they shared the landscape, they did not care what other religion you were, and all these kinds of things. So that that rings very much true with all the other resources of understanding that we both and all pursue to try to figure out a way out of this terrible situation. As we close, Muhammad, I'd like to ask you one more question by mentioning another important resource for people. There's a an organization called Breakthrough News, Breakthrough News at YouTube. And they have a program this week hosted by Rania Khalek and the Electronic Intifada Journal's writer named Ali Abunima. Okay, and they are talking about the Palestinian situation, the relation between that or the comparison between that and the Ukrainian situation. And I would just, it's 80 minutes long, but it is one of the best conversations recently of what a terribly troubling game the Israelis are playing with the Palestinian people, with the mounting attacks on Al-Aqsa Mosque. They're constantly trying to remind the Palestinians that we are in control. We are taking over more and more than ever. And there's basically nothing you can say or do about it. Would you like to leave our listeners with a final kind of comment or statement out of your situation this week? Uh, our situation is uh, getting worse and worse, and I am not exaggerating uh, when I uh, tell you this truth. Uh, our situation is very, very bad. Our crises are uh, increasing day after day. Uh, now we have a new crisis. Yesterday, they had no any existence. Now we have electricity. Now we have electricity crisis. Uh, gas uh, crisis, transportation crisis, food crisis, medicine crisis, healthcare crisis, uh, travel and the checkpoints crisis, uh, <laughs> liberties and uh, uh, opinion crisis. Uh, 
you have to speak about uh, un, un, unlimited, uh, infinity, infinity uh, kinds and sorts of a crisis. And this I'm sorry the, to say, uh, this, is, this is what we must expect, must be the truth, because all the powerful countries of the world refuse to recognize the situation and to do anything about it. They can do things and take actions and send weapons to Ukraine in five days, but they can do nothing for the Palestinians. We must ask people once again to appeal to their own governments, to demand that their own governments change their relationship with Israel and the Palestinians. This cannot go on. This is a big, big shame. This is big shame. Uh, and uh, uh, words cannot express our uh, our feeling. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when I see uh, this uh, prejudice, and when I used to compare between what happened in, in Ukraine and what happened here in Gaza now, <coughs> I got I, I got crazy. I got crazy. Uh, here in Gaza, no one is looking to us. No one is helping us now. Uh, I, I sink in, in darkness. Uh, I I haven't enough food, enough medicine. I am uh, sieged here in Gaza in, in, uh, in a very, very tough uh, prison. Uh, people who are sick with cancer, with uh, yes. chronic uh, diseases, they are dying. They are dying just in front of the fence because yes. they cannot, because they cannot just cross very very few meters just to go to the uh, to the other side of the fence they are dying in front of the fence yes. in front of the middle fence they cannot and, uh, and cross across just just very very few meters can you imagine these few meters uh, are meaning life and survival for those people and uh, they cannot achieve this cross so they and, die and they and they come back to uh, to to uh, to, uh, to Gaza just for burial. And these stark and horrifying differences are all across the spectrum. There's a terrible, almost terminal water shortage in Gaza, and yet just over the border there are bars and cafes and hotels that have fountains and swimming pools and places where you can swim up to the bar to have your cocktail, plenty of food, plenty of energy. It, it cannot go on. So I, I hope we can agree tonight to look forward to our next talk and to ask and plead with the world, meanwhile, for citizens to get involved with changing their own government policies because that's the only point of power we have to struggle forward with this. Muhammad, I, I want to thank you for this conversation, and I know everybody that's listened will will feel the same. So we keep you in our hearts and our minds and our politics, and uh, I can only wish you well until our next conversation, my brother. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you, and uh, I am looking forward for other uh, meetings and conversations. Thank you yes. so much. <laughs> Thank you, Muhammad, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much.